so the, the title of the talk today is Simulant in Anger, which is an experience re report about applying simulation testing to my financial system. But first, let's get started with a bit of background about me. My name is Ryan Neufeld. I am an alumni of Cognitect, as well as the co-author of the Closure Cookbook, as well as the author of Application Architecture for Developers. And since working for Cognitect, I moved on to found my own company called Homegrown Labs, which is a consulting and product company that helps companies gain confidence in critical systems. And one of our big clients today is a company called Viso, which is an Irish financial services company that I'm helping uh, with a few others, one of them here in the audience, Howard Lewis Ship, build a mobile payment system by the name of Mix. So this talk is broken up into three parts. The first, we're going to talk about what is the Mix system. In the second part, we're going to talk about what is simulation testing. And in the third part, we're going to explore what we learned from applying it to the Mix system. So we start with Mix. Mix is a next generation mobile wallet, uh, somewhat similar to Apple Pay, if you're familiar, that facilitates smartphone oriented transactions between consumers and merchants. And to take a little bit of a closer look at what kinds of entities we're interacting with, we have consumers and issuers on the top. If you're not familiar with what an issuer is, usually this is your bank or some third party uh, that's participating in transactions on your behalf. And on the flip side, you have merchants and acquirers who represent merchants. And you both meet in the, in the middle, and you agree that you'd like to pay for some goods or services. And one of the special things that we add on top uh, instead of just being a simple payment mediator, is something called value-added services. And these are additional functionality like loyalty programs, couponing, etc. So instead of having to print out a paper coupon or carry a loyalty card with you, if you're shopping at a participating store in Europe, uh, as it would have it, you can just see on your phone that uh, you can apply coupons or participate in those programs right from your phone, which is pretty convenient. So zooming in a little bit, behind the covers, Mix is a microservice architecture, meaning that it's built up of a cluster of services that collaborate together to provide payment services. So that's all well and good, but we have one catch. We're going to be landing on Mars, so to speak. Mix is a completely greenfield system, meaning we have no prior on-the-ground experience with how that application is going to perform in this strange environment. And this isn't very dissimilar from the Mars rover itself, which was going to be faced with extreme temperatures and environments, and NASA having no direct way to test on Mars without the extreme cost. Uh, and you can imagine uh, you wouldn't run unit tests where you shipped a new rover to Mars every time you wanted to check a single character change. For us, our extreme environment is landing in, one hundreds, of, in hundreds of stores on day one and servicing thousands of tellers. Uh, the very moment that we deploy, which is kind of a big challenge. And it means that we're not going to get any second chances. We can't show up in the stores and be the same antiquated, slow, crappy system that people hate to use the very day we land there. We need to engender a number of qualities to make sure that we are successful. So what does success mean for the Mixed Project? What kind of constraints do we have to work within when we're trying to build the system and make sure that it's fit for task? So the first thing we need to do is make sure that we can deliver the thing on time. We have real merchants that have signed up to get this system in their store later this year. So we need to be sure that we're finished on time. And that means, excuse me, uh, and I'd estimate we actually only have about 3.5 developers on the project on average. We would had three previously this year and have only recently added a fourth. And so that means that we have very little bandwidth for testing our features, let alone extensive testing of how the system is going to operate. So we have to be very mindful of where we spend our time. The second criteria for success, the system must not only be delivered quickly, it needs to be fast when it gets there. Attention and patience for technological interactions is vanishingly small in consumers. We can't afford to be that slow system on day one. And finally, we need to be able to scale from that initial load of thousands of tellers to any number more. 
And to make matters worse, we've kind of stumbled upon a rather novel technique where we can actually introduce the mix system into stores with no hardware and no software changes at those point of sales. I'm not going to share with you how we do that, but to me as a, a developer on this project, I perceive that, touch the mic, I perceive that as a significant risk that we might be seeing a lot of load very quickly after we launch. So how did NASA ensure that the rover was fit to task? Well, they did it by simulating reality. They replicated the conditions that the rover would endure, extremely high temperatures that it would see during entry, the low temperatures it would see traveling through space, and the harsh, arid conditions that it would uh, go through when it actually got onto the ground. Now, we wanted to do something similar for Mix. We wanted to throw it off the deep end, to bombard it with traffic, and to make sure that it could survive. But how? We looked at a number of tools. Uh, we looked at performance testing tools like Siege and HTTPerf, which could give us a very good idea about how certain very specific endpoints performed, but rather too narrowly focused for us to understand how the entire system operated. Integration-style tests with something such as JMeter or Selenium could give us some very useful information about correctness and even a little bit of scale, but they're often too rigid and prescribed. So enter simulation testing. Uh, I would describe simulation testing as a holistic approach that can not only verify the features, uh, that features in an application are correct, but validate properties like the performance and robustness of that system. And to me, this is the quintessential black box test. It injects behavior on one end and measures the output on the other. But didn't I just say we weren't doing integration tests, but then I described integration tests as the thing that simulation testing was? Not quite. There's a little bit of a subtle difference here. Integration tests are what you might call a specification-based approach to testing. They step through a predefined set of actions validating the results along the way. Simulation testing, on the other hand, is what you would call a generative testing approach. Rather than defining exactly what a test will do, a simulation test defines what a test could do, and it lets the framework do the, less, the rest of the work from there. So not only, uh, excuse me, so this is, this is great. Both of these approaches can certainly validate the correctness of features to some degree that we know about. I think where simulation tests really shine being generative is that they can actually explore unknown and strange possibilities that your developers would never really think of happening in your system, but your users are bound to try. But features alone don't necessarily equal a well-functioning system. And there's something we've miss, we're missing, and I've mentioned it a few times, and that is the qualities that our system exudes. And these are sometimes called non-functional requirements uh, in other parlances. And these are things like your system's performance, robustness, or security. And they're the kinds of things that round out your system, taking it from an unusable but feature-complete pile of junk to something that's truly usable by the target audience. So that, the last mile, validating those qualities is what we were seeking in a tool. And with all those other tools out of the question, that left us with one rather not very well-known option. Enter Simulant. Now, Simulant is a closure is a closure-based simulation testing framework built on top of Datomic from the fine folks at Cognitect. And in traditional Cognitect fashion, uh, we all know this so well, it decomposes all of the essential aspects of testing into a number of disparate pieces. And what results, I think, is actually greater than the sum of its parts. And we'll see that, uh, see why shortly. So the very first stage of a simulation test is the model phase. And this is where we capture all of the potential user behavior that a user might partake in our system into a probabilistic Markov model like this. And we can create that either by an uh, informed guess or by directly analyzing what happens in real life, which we didn't have the opportunity to do. And so what this does is it lets our sims explore states that we might not have considered previously. If you can imagine that for some reason hitting B 10 times in a row might cause a problem, most normal tests might not find that. But with a simulation test, we're bound to run through a random walk through this that cycles over B just enough times to cause an error. 
The next phase after we have this model of what our users could do is to take that randomness and realize it into a concrete set of planned actions, which Simulant calls its test. And since this sampling, where we walk through this model and come up with this stream of actions, happens before we actually run the test, we have the very nice added benefit that we can revisit that test at some point later in the future. Now, my, why might you want to do that? Well, if you can imagine that you ran into some, str uh, to some combination like this one here that elicited a strange error in your application, you could debug that error, deploy a correction to it, and then run over the exact same set of inputs to ensure that you'd actually corrected the issue. In this same way, if you've identified particularly problematic combinations, you could capture those tests and run them every once in a while to make sure that you haven't slipped through on any strange edge cases. And not only can we generate a single stream of actions, we're actually able to generate any number of users. So in the case of Aviso, we want to stress the system not with one user, but tens or hundreds of users. So using that same model, we can take different random samplings through it and come up with a full set of differing actions that each agent can take. Now the sim phase of Simulant is where we finally run our tests. We have the opportunity at the beginning here to do some setup, things like creating user accounts or gathering a baseline for performance. And then we spawn up any number of processes, either as threads on one machine or across multiple, machine, multiple machines that will run our planned actions. And instead of validating those as we go, we write all of the results and pertinent information that we gather from that system to an action log residing in Datomic. And what that lets us do is really cool. Since all of our validation information is in a database, most of our validations can actually be written just as simple queries. If you can imagine you wanted to find out if you had any slow queries or any queries that errored out, that would simply be a matter of selecting any action log entries that had an error or were too slow. Beyond that, it also gives us the ability not only to consider requests and responses individually, but in aggregate, allowing you to do things like collect performance summaries for your run, or uh, as something we'll see later, gather how many transactions per minute our system can do by considering everything that we did across the entire run. And since, like test, this is separate from invocation, we can actually retroactively run new validations against old simulations. So if your business managers or project managers come up with some new condition that your system should not fail, you can implement a validation for that, and then you can go back through time and find out, were you compliant through history? And if not, do you need to enact any retroactive changes or reconciliations to correct for that error that you've made? So finally, that brings us to our last section, simulant and mix. So when we set out to build a simulation test for the MIX system, we had a couple of goals. The first thing we wanted to do was gather a baseline for performance in the system. We wanted to understand, given where we were going, how close are we now? How much work do we need to do and how much of our effort do we need to put towards making sure our system is fit for task for delivery? And finally, we wanted to come out of the process of building a simulation test with a tool that would let us incrementally identify and correct hotspots in our application to make sure that we could go that extra mile. So how long did it take to build this? Well, to get from nothing to a simple smoke test simulation that basically ran the acquirer side of the equation took us about a week. It's not terrible, but it's not great. And it gets worse when you consider that it probably took us about another whole month after that of one person's time to ramp up that simulation to a full multi-user flow, which was issuers and acquirers interacting and closing payments. So why did it take so long? Well, at the time, tools and knowledge around Simulant were scarce. We were lucky enough that I had had some experience with the fine folks from Cognitech working with Mike Nygaard on other simulation tests that I kind of knew where I was going. But if you don't have that kind of experience, it can be tough. Simulant's APIs are well designed, but with very few clear examples of how to synthesize them into a decent simulation to utilize it, 
you can run into problems where you might be able to build a simulation that works in some cases, but have a lot of difficulty going the last mile for it. And to make matters a tiny bit worse, Things don't necessarily work entirely correctly until you have a whole picture of your simulation. You have all of the pieces from model to validation. So that can be a bit of a challenge. And I think that Simulant is a little bit like closure. Uh, someone said this, I don't know who, I couldn't find an attribution, but someone said once of closure that it was hard to learn, but it pays you back. And I think that Simulant really did pay us back in developing the Mix application. So what did we find? How did it pay us back? Well, the first thing we actually ran into, and it actually ballooned that time a little bit, was that we, we hit issues with our system itself where it didn't behave like we'd expected. Even though our features were tested, they didn't behave quite the same as they did under integration tests as they did for truly external clients in a deployed environment. So this is already one of the places where simulation testing is very valuable. We were developing a system that was going to be consumed by third parties that would integrate against it. And we had the opportunity to experience ourselves what that implementation looked like and to make improvements to our APIs themselves and the documentation to make sure that there were less road bumps when it came to those merchants integrating against our systems. Once we actually got it running, we found something rather interesting. We discovered that even under the most modest amounts of loads, our system started to thrash very badly. We went searching for hotspots, and we found some interesting things. Through monitoring data in your kit, we ended up finding that even though we had planned on our system being elastically scalable outwards on AWS, that it never did that. And the reason was because we had written our auto-scaling triggers to presume that our system would have a high amount of CPU load when there were many users interacting with it. As it turned out, our system was not CPU bound, it was IO bound, and as such, it never scaled out. So we'll add that one to the to-do list, but there's something that's still wrong here with the individual services. When I say modest amount of traffic, I don't mean hundreds of users, I mean we only had five to 10 users interacting with some of these services and they were falling over. And that's just completely unacceptable. We, we can't afford to have one instance of a service running for every few tellers in a store. That's absolutely ridiculous and it's not going to scale. It's going to cost so much money to run that system. So we went looking further and we found the culprit. One of our most important functions, the create payment endpoint, seemed to be getting hit particularly bad. Under any load, the response times tended to be either 10 seconds or no seconds. It just never returned. Uh, hence, locking up the entire simulation and making me pull my hair out. So being a microservice architecture, it turns out we were tripped up by one of those little faux pas that you can have, where you can be a little bit too chatty with, between your services. So when we had tens of requests pouring into the acquirer, they fanned out to tens of requests on the transaction engine and tens of requests on the value-added services all of which had to make sure that the user they were talking to was who they said they were. So all of them collectively beat the crap out of the authentication service and dragged the entire system to a halt. So we had to figure out a way to fix this. And we figured what better way than to just not do that at all. We won't call the authentication service uh, ever to check if a user is validated. So how we did that is actually pretty cool. If you've never heard of JWTs, uh, there's something called JSON Web Tokens, and they're this really cool piece of tech that's actually about to become a, a standard. And what it is, is it encodes small payloads of JSON uh, that contain claims about who a user is and what they can do and when the token expires, all into a short little uh, randomized looking token. And what more, we can encrypt those on the authentication service so A, our clients can't inspect what abilities they have, and B, we can verify that the token we're receiving actually did come from our own service. So with all of that out of the way, we made some pretty substantial improvements. And I'll just make a note, um, we're gonna talk in relative measures. My clients asked me not to share specifics about what our exact response times are, but I'll give you ballparks. So for starters, we improved our mean response time for successful responses uh, 
two times, which meant we got very well under the half a second mark, which is getting close to that real time-ish feel that we'd like to have from a financial uh, system. We still got a ways to go, but that's an improvement from where it was before. Even better, for the responses that actually completed, we improved our, or reduced our maximum response time by a third, meaning that now, um, at a very high percentile, almost all of our operations are coming in under one second. We're just starting to get comfortable. Even better, we reduced our error rate in our simulations from 70, a staggering 75%, basically not working at all, down to zero. And that gave us a really good indication that we should increase the amount of load we're throwing at our servers because the number of instances it has can very easily handle the load we're throwing at it. And this, imp these improvements apply not only to the create function, but across the entire system. We saw an almost five times improvement in our overall throughput for just basically running as many transactions as we could per minute. And where we were before we started this process was we could run 30 transactions per minute no matter how many services there were, no matter how many users there were, we could never go past that watermark. And now, we're up to a point where we can run about 170 transactions per minute with very minimal hardware and uh, about 10 to 20 users interacting with the system at once. And that is also proportional to the number of services and users, which means that yes, we actually can scale this to some point where we'd be able to handle thousands of stores. So. What other things did we find out uh, by going through this process other than just raw performance changes? Well, one of the big things it did for us was it eroded a lot of false confidences we'd previously held about the system. And I think as developers, we're inherently very optimistic about the systems we build. We have a, a confidence that we haven't really earned that those systems are just going to work out when we put them into production. And it was, uh, it was really good to get rid of those confidences, uh, those false confidences, and instead replace them in some true confidences, some hard facts and measures about our system's correctness and the qualities that it exuded. And it allowed us to answer some important questions about our system. Ma namely, are we there yet? And how far do we have to go? And finally, while we're not at the finish line yet, we now have a tool to continuously improve and change our application as we reach towards our production goals. And as a bit of an anecdote, I mentioned how long it took to build the simulation test itself, but never how long it took to make those improvements to it. Uh, as it happens, it only took about a week or two once we'd had the simulation and were dedicated to improving that hotspot to get it out of the way, which I think is a pretty fantastic improvement in performance for such a short investment of time. So in closing, I think simulation testing is something that takes us the extra mile in testing, allowing us not only to test the features that our system has, but the qualities that it exudes. And I think those are so important. No one would ever want to work with a website that took one minute to respond to every page request or leaked all of your private information to another, uh, another party. And those things are important in how your system actually works. So you might be asking, is simulation testing for your company? And I don't want to have any illusions here. I think simulation testing right now is a pretty expensive uh, proposition. It does take a decent amount of time. And I would consider this a little bit uh, in the light of a, a medical analogy. If you can imagine you have a system that's not terribly large and something isn't quite working right, you might go to your doctor with that system and they might prescribe some over-the-counter remedies. And those aren't very expensive, they're easy to do, and you're probably going to get the results you're looking for. If you fall off a mountain and you break your legs, or your system does rather, when you go into the doctor, they're not going to suggest that you just go and take some Tylenol. They're going to suggest some advanced diagnostic medicine. And I think that's the kind of thing that simulation testing is. When it really hurts, you need to resort to these kinds of tools to get better insights onto how your system is performing. So, the biggest thing you have to ask if you're considering if you want to implement simulation testing on your own system, or if you should, rather, is, is your system high risk? Is your company's reputation, its money, or, its li or, or people's lives at risk if you make a mistake in implementing it? And if the answer is yes, then I think the time that you would spend on implementing a simulation test would easily dwarf the potential upside. And as kind of an addendum to this, this is actually something I'd like to change in the future. 
I'd like to lower that bar from high risk, meaning that you should maybe use simulation testing, to maybe moderate risk. And I want to do this by, through education, tools, and services that make it more palatable for a company to entertain simulation testing. And where we're going to start with, that, with the journey that I'm taking on educating people about simulation testing starts tonight at an unsession that is being held at 7 p.m. I can't remember the exact room, but I'll be there. And what I'm going to do in that unsession is cover some of the basics of getting your own smoke test simulation test up and running. And uh, as a very special announcement, I'm going to be releasing a simulation testing template that will hopefully get you through from zero to simple in hours rather than days. So thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, we've got actually quite a bit of time for questions. I ran a little bit fast. You can find my slides at this URL here. If you have any questions that don't fit within the hallway or the confines of this talk, feel free to reach out online at homegrown.io slash askmeanything and I'll get back to you in a few days. And finally, if you're interested in learning more about simulation testing and hearing about when this uh, new helpful content comes out or new tools and libraries are released, feel free to go to my website at homegrown.io and sign up for my mailing list. Thank you very much.